So now that we've introduced the notion of a homomorphism or a structure preserving map, we're ready to introduce a new key object, the dual space. So I'll begin with a vector space as we're used to, which I'll just remind you is over the set of real numbers. And this is going to be a finite dimensional finite dimensional vector space, meaning that the number of basis vectors that we have, these EIs, the I runs from 1 up to some finite number D, where D is the dimension of the space. So I mentioned previously that this field that we define the vector space over, the field of real numbers, R, is itself a vector space or can be realized as a vector space. So in the spirit of the previous video where we introduced homomorphisms between two vector spaces, we could consider the set of homomorphisms between our vector space and the field of real numbers, since the real numbers are just another vector space. So this HOM notation just stands for the set of all maps or rather not just any maps, they're the structure preserving maps or homomorphisms to give them their fancy name. But this object is so important that it gets its own name. So the set of all maps between the vector space uh, and the underlying field is the dual space. And we give it the notation uh, V star. So V star is defined as the set of all structure preserving maps between the vector space and the underlying field. Okay, so that's just a definition. Let's actually pull apart what it means. So I'm going to call the elements of the dual space, or I'm going to denote them uh, using Greek letters. So if we have some omega, which is a dual vector, as they're called, simply an element of the dual space, we know that this should be a map because it comes from the set of all possible maps. So omega is going to be a map which takes a vector from V and takes us into the real numbers. So just remember this is the notation we're going to be using for the map. The map itself is the, the dual vector object and we notate how it acts on a vector using this bracket notation. So V is a vector in V, and omega is a dual vector in the dual space. So now we need to realize that because this dual space is defined as the set of all maps, and we saw previously that um, this HOM is the set of all structure preserving or linear maps in the case of vector spaces, this V star is a vector space. It's, it's the dual vector space, but it is actually just a vector space in the definition that we defined previously. So we could write it as V star, and then it'll have its own set of addition and scalar multiplication operations, which act on the, the dual vectors in the dual space. So because it's a vector space, we know that we can find or define a basis for this space. So I'm going to call this basis B star, say, which is simply a subset of the dual space such that any dual vector in the space can be expressed as a linear combination of these basis vectors. And now the way I write this down should look familiar, but you'll notice a key difference. OK, so I'm calling our basis the dual basis vectors these uh, elements epsilon. So this epsilon is the dual basis vector and this omega sub i is the dual basis or the, the, the dual vector component with respect to that particular basis vector. And now notice we must have i being the same dimension as before for this to make sense. So this should look very familiar 
if I just contrast this to how we can express a vector, so if we have some v in v, the vector space, we saw that we could write this in terms of the, the vector basis as vi scalar multiplied and then the vector basis. So now we see the difference. The vector basis comes with a, a lower index, whereas the dual vector basis comes with an upper index and the opposite for the component. So we understand how to perform this sum using the summation convention. So you might sometimes hear the terms contravariant and covariant thrown around. I'm not going to use any of that terminology as it's clunky and confusing. We're just going to call elements of the vector space vectors, elements of the dual space dual vectors. So the dual vectors use a basis which has an upstairs index, whereas the vectors have a lower index on their basis. Now, if you remember when I first wrote this down, I simply just made a choice to write this index uh, with a subscript for the basis vector. Now we see why that choice was important in that when we define the dual basis vector to, to kind of let us know that it's different from the, the vector basis, we give it an upstairs index. This holds no more information other than the fact that it's signifying that this dual basis is different from the vector basis in some way. The placement of the indices is purely a conventional choice born out of the fact that I chose to start with a subscript over here for the vector basis. Okay, so this tells us how we can express any dual vector in terms of the dual basis, but we still don't actually know what this dual basis is. Okay, so now we know how to express any dual vector in terms of the dual basis, but we're still not any closer to knowing what this dual basis actually is. So we would expect, or we would like, that this dual basis is going to be related to the vector basis in some way. And the easiest way to see this is just to simply realize that the dual basis is just a map, so it can eat a vector. So let's let it eat uh, the basis, the vector basis, which I'm going to use now a different index for. You'll see why in a second. And now we don't know how to compute this, but we would like them to be related in some non-trivial way. So we still don't actually know how to compute this. We simply just need to make a choice of what this should be, which then defines how the dual basis is related to the vector basis. So for now, I'm going to decide or define that this is going to be equal to the Kronecker delta, where the Kronecker delta is defined to be one if i is equal to j and zero otherwise. So the choice didn't have to be this simple. We could have in general written down anything for this uh, relation between the, the dual and the vector basis. We'll see later that these two can actually be related in a more non-trivial way using something called the metric. But for now, we're just going to stick with a simple choice of letting them be related by this Kronecker delta. So now that we've done this, we've related the dual basis to the vector basis. We can use this to compute the map of any vector with any dual vector. So to do that, we simply need to write down the expansion of a dual vector and a vector. So if I begin with some omega mapping some vector, we can just expand these out. And now we realize because this is a linear map, we're able to pull these scalar components out of the map. And because they're simply just real numbers, they're just multiplied like regular numbers. I'm just going to juxtapose them not write any multiplication symbol and then we're just left with the result which we previously defined so we can immediately write down that this is equal to omega i v j times delta i j and now we completely understand how to compute this object using the summation convention we have two summed indices which is just going to so so, so when we compute this sum the Kronecker delta effectively sets all other terms apart from when as i is equal to j equal to zero.
So this can just simply be understood as the following sum, which is just going to be some real number. So we've succeeded in mapping a vector using the dual vector into a real number. OK, so if I just recap over what we've actually done now, we began with a real vector space, a finite dimensional vector space, defined over the set of real numbers. Then we constructed the, the set of all the structure preserving maps, or the homomorphisms, between our vector space and the underlying field, which I've said before is just another vector space. So this set of all maps that we can create between V and R gets its own name, it's called the dual space where elements of this dual space are these dual vectors, which simply are maps which eat a vector and give us a real number. And then we realized, or as we showed previously, that the set of all maps between two vector spaces is just another vector space. So we can realize this dual space as a vector space in itself. And then we defined or understood what the dual basis for this vector space would be. And then we wrote down a rule for how we map the dual basis with the basis vectors, which then allows us, by the linearity of the map, to compute the result of mapping any dual vector with a vector. And it just gives us this fairly simple relation where we just multiply and add up the components together. So I kind of said it was obvious that we should have the dimensionality of the two space, spaces being equal, that wasn't actually obvious when I wrote it down, but now we understand to write this down, we need to have um, <clears throat> the number of indices that we can cycle through being equal. So the dimensionality of the two spaces has to be the same so that we can write down this definition here.